Simon Terry is, <coughs> I can say, one of the founding members of this research group. He's been with us in the Digital Disruption Research Group from day one, uh, even though he's based in Melbourne. Um, he's uh, given a talk at the very first uh, Disrupt Sydney. It's been six years, so he has some new things to say, I presume. <laughs> yep. um, so we're very proud to have uh, Simon uh, share with us um, his, his latest uh, ideas. He's also writing a, a book uh, called Degrees of Freedom. When is that going to be published? Uh, it depends when I finish it, Carl. Yeah. Oh, that's, you know, it's, that's almost like writing a thesis, right? Yeah. Um, so he used to work for a big bank in Melbourne, um, being a disruptor there. This is how we got to know each other. I was doing research uh, on Yammer in the workplace, and he was championing this and disrupting the organization, being uh, subversive and uh, giving employees a voice and therefore leading a whole lot of innovation uh, within the bank. Um, he is now the chairman and owner of Change Agents Worldwide, and he embodies that role. So um, thank you very much for coming along and, and sharing your ideas with us. And it's, it's the best title. Uh, if your company had, was a country, would you live there? And I think we should all ask ourselves that question, right? If, this, if our organization we work for was a country, you know, and we reflected on the leadership, would we really stay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as, as, as Kai's introduced, a couple of years ago, this question hit me. If your, if your company was a country, would you live there? And it's become one of those really disturbing questions to me. It's one of those questions that I've lived with and, and inspires a lot of what I do because I'm a consultant, I'm a change agent, and my personal passion is that the future of work should be more human. And when I look and I talk to people about many organizations, they reflect North Korea more than a place I'd like to live. And so what I want to welcome you to is a short journey through the ideology of corporate life and then a conversation about what do we do about it? How do we create the change? Because the other thing that fascinates me is how real, enduring change occurs in social systems. And to really see that, we need to step beyond our traditional models of corporate change, start to think about some of the edge practitioners from Pete's talk this morning and some of our corporate superheroes, and we'll come back and include those as we talk along. So let's look first at one of those core ideas that we, we have. We all know our organisations are meritocratic, aren't they? They're meritocratic, but the reality is we live in oligarchies. Our organizations don't open the corridors of power to merit. How do we know that? Let's just take one fact, for example. Gender diversity and, and generally. In 2017, there were more CEOs of the ASX 200 called John than there were women. Okay, 2018 was a good year because boards wrote a number of Dear John letters and actually women moved in front of the Johns in 2018. But the issue we face is actually there were more Andrews in 2018 than women. So here we are in an, in an organisation that talk relentlessly about merit and in one fundamental sense we're not seeing that merit reflected in the way people's careers and opportunities develop. Less than 20% of that same cohort are from non-European, um, uh, sorry, non-Anglo-Saxon backgrounds. And 15% and of those people are from European backgrounds. So we're not particularly diverse. We're not particularly clear at the top of our organisations. Let's think for a moment about how we accept fairness in our organisations. Our performance management and bonus systems are designed around inequality. In 2017, the ASX 100 CEOs collectively got a 12.5% pay increase and an 18% increase in their bonuses. That delivered them at the point where their earnings were 22 times average weekly earnings. That's a pretty unequal outcome. Now, I'm not going to enter into the merits of the economic arguments because I know there'll be people sitting in this room saying, but of course we're competing for CEO talent in a global economy. Of course we have to pay what the market demands. 
United States CEOs earned on average in the same year 70 times average weekly earnings. If it was an open and competitive market, why aren't US corporates hiring our cheap Andrews? <laughs> We've got lots of cheap Andrews that could be hired. There's, these, are, these are clues to issues we need. What we've done is we start to accept radical unfairness. I won't talk about the gender wage gap, but you know it's there. I've done a lot of work, as Kai mentioned before, about collaboration. Organisations accept that defining performance at an individual level is the best way to manage performance, and that the only unit that can be structured together is a team. Wider dynamics of collaboration, the fact that in a digital economy, our teams are increasingly interconnected, the big challenges we want to solve involve the whole organisation, are disregarded. I won't tell you what organisation it was, but once in, or twice, or, or in fact very often in my career, I've had people say to me, I know that's an organisational goal, but it's not on my scorecard. We've all had those conversations. Why do they happen? Why are we sitting here letting them happen? We all know the best way to achieve performance is through control. We have assumed the machine metaphor. We have taken it into the very heart of how we think management works. Business schools, in many cases, were created to enable engineers to become managers, and with that, we dragged in a whole bunch of machinery, engineering mindset. We, 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 we tr when we expect our employees to be robots, no wonder we can replace them. The great challenges we face are ones with, which take human creativity, human collaboration, instinct, intuition, a broader dynamic. We need to be able to bring that challenge into our organisations. Surveillance is, of course, the best form of security. 90% of the world's global data was created in the last two years. That's an awful lot of Facebook targeting. I'm joking, but the point is our natural re reaction to an issue of security in our organisations or a question about risk is to gather more data, is to focus in on those small units of performance. We're not looking for alternatives as to how we create security. All those organisations that Clayton Christensen tracked that went broke, the Nokias, the Kodaks that have been mentioned today, they had great data. They knew exactly how their businesses were performing. The challenge for disruption is we need to look beyond that data. We need to look to a broader context. North Korea has great data on its people. Propaganda is truth. We have a crisis of trust in our societies. It's not just Australia, it's global. At the most recent Edelman Trust Barometer, trust in media in Australia was 31%. 31%. That's second worst in the world after Turkey, which is currently in the transition to a dictatorship. Now, you say, but that's all right. Government's better. No, government was 35 Business in Australia was 42% and all those three results had declined in the most recent survey. Why do we not trust our institutions? We're a cynical bunch. We know they're not telling us the truth. We've seen the difference between what they say and what they do. And hold that idea because that's actually underpinning the dialogue here. There's a difference between what we're talking about. Trust is critical to our business performance. We value our stakeholders. But by the way, the processes are broken and the fees are going up. And we only need to look at various royal commissions that are surrounding us at the moment to see the implications of that. Compliance is life. Pete stole my statistic because I stole it from Deloitte. But $250 billion um, co compliance cost in Australia, 150 billion of that is private. Compliance. That's not the stuff that government requires you to do. That's all those forms we have to fill out. That's all those people who sit and track and monitor. This is a pretty big case for change. Time is money. Organisations constantly remind us of that. Um, 
Pathology Awareness Australia measured the cost of presenteeism in our organisation. It was $34 billion. That was not just the cost of people turning up and doing no work. It was actually the impact of those people turning up and doing no work on the people around them as well, because it saps our culture, it saps our organisations. Actually, it also includes making them sick, which is a real issue as well. So is it time to move country? Well, the part of the challenge we have when we look at that question is, what makes you think the other companies are any better than yours? This is a management ideology. This is a wide-scale dictatorship of ideology that we actually often don't question. And I think one of the challenges for us is we start, need to start reflecting on what do we do about this? Because we can sit and sh move from con company or country to country, but we're not going to get any change if all we do is exit. And so this is a bit of a call to action to fight. So. In 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, trying to convince the American people to join the Second World War and create freedom for a number of people then subject to oppression, put out these four fundamental freedoms. Freedom from fear, freedom of speech, freedom from poverty, and freedom of belief. I'd like to mark corporate Australia a fail against most of these. And that's a pretty, pretty damning statistic. If you think, you know, you can die, I, I could, we can go for hours, and I've only got 15 minutes on the statistics, but most people know in their hearts they are afraid in their organisations. There's 32% of people living in poverty in Australia, and that's 3 million people, rely on wages primarily for their income. So we've got a significant issue with poverty as well. Vaclav Havel, when he took over as president of Czechoslovakia, in his first speech, spoke about a contaminated moral environment being the challenge that that, that, that country needed to, to tackle coming out of communism. People had said one thing and done something different. And the, here's the need for a change. So what I'm believe strongly is we need to start thinking about new degrees of freedom in our organisations. We need to start thinking about power and purpose, moving from power as our model of change to purpose as the foundation. And there's been a lot of discussion about purpose today. We need to create engagement, engagement's one thing, but participation. Pete's point about doing, that's fundamental. We need to develop agency. In, in people and to encourage them and give them opportunities to create change and move into a learning mindset. I call it degrees of freedom because I'm a realist. I actually don't think we're going to go from where we are today to complete transformation. What we need to do and what you've heard through the speeches this morning is just loosen the reins a little bit. Because if you loosen the reins, human nature will make it happen. It's all about realising human potential. We need, if we're going to realise human potential, we've got to bring people together so they can solve the problems. They've got to be able to free to share the information that they need to share. They've got to be able to solve the problems and create new solutions. It's not hard. It's fundamental human collaboration. In most organisations, it's happening. It just has to happen under the radar because you get caught, there's consequences. I saw a fantastic thing shared online the other day which was a definition of agency. And it was long, and it was academic, and it was gobbledygook. And I wrote back to the person who posted it and said, is it fair to say what that definition means is, agency is the ability to have options without consequences? And I got an answer, yeah, that's kind of about what that means. But if you think about that, how easy is it in your organisation to give people options without consequences? Because if they have options without consequences, these things become possible. People start to be able to contribute solutions to these change. They start to feel like they can make a difference. And the most powerful thing in the world is a small group of people who think they can make a difference. Give them the chance. So you need to find your change agents. You need to find your organisational superheroes, your edge workers, the people who can make change happen 
and you need to back them to the hilt, just as Pete did when he stepped in and provided air cover. You need to let those people form change movements to threaten the power base in the organisation. All the things that I've talked about today reinforce our current power structures. They reinforce our systems and our implementation, our organisations. To create degrees of freedom, we need to enable people to change that. There's a lot of literacy about, literature about creating global change movements, but this is my list having studied a number of different ones around the world, from civil rights movements to movements to overthrow dictatorships. And this is also lean, leaning very heavily on the work of people like Jean Sharp um, and others who've done great work on nonviolent change um, globally. You need gatherings. You don't have a revolution unless people can get together in some way. Those people need to share a purpose. Not 100%, but some kind of shared purpose. They want to share stories because your success comes from bringing other people in and that's part of your narrative. You need symbols because symbols are enduring and they help spread the message across the, um, across the world. Uh, here's one that I love. So when, um, when the resistance movement in Serbia wanted to overthrow the Milosevic government that was quite dictatorial, one of the things they did was they would release ping pong balls in public squares. It makes no sense. It makes no sense, except that Milosevic government was so afraid of opposition that they would send the Secret Service out to pick up the ping pong balls. And nothing looks more ridiculous than Secret Service agents running around public squares trying to pick up ping pong balls. And so they mocked the institutions of government that were oppressing them in a really simple low risk gesture. That's a symbol that shows the potential of change. You need that kind of action. You need to adapt and learn and grow and develop. And so you need your community to be tight knit and to have a learning orientation. Now, all of that should fit within your corporate culture. None of that should be dangerous. That's the kind of thing that more our agile organizations are trying to create. But let's be clear, implementing agile in your organization will fail if you keep the old management mindset, if you don't allow these kinds of changes, agile alone, design thinking alone, even ethnography on its own, won't make the change unless you embrace the ideological change. So you may not knock down a whole wall, but you could put a hole in it. My career, I put a few holes in a few walls. Some of them got patched up. Some of them stayed open. What I'd encourage you to do as we go through the rest of the day is think about what's your wall? What's your one change? What's one chink you could put in that journey? Because if we're going to have the kind of organisations we deserve, we need to start making some change happen and we have to do it together. Thank you. <laughs>